Right, and we are we are live on Facebook. Um, I welcome those that are joining us on the live stream, and uh, we're moving into our study. Last week we had our introduction to First and Second Timothy, and today we actually jump more into the scriptures. We're looking at First Timothy uh, specifically. If you want to put the slide up over here, Dave. Uh, specifically, we're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. And, and, and just kind of uh, where we're looking at here, uh, like many of the letters of Paul, and in fact, as we read in Peter, significant portions of 1 and 2 Peter, and in James, he's warning about false teachers. And let's go ahead and pick up in verse 3. We covered part of verse 3 last week. Uh, and Paul writes to young Timothy, who is the pastor of which church? What? Ephesus, the church in Ephesus. And he says, as I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, and we talked about his departure to Macedonia last week, he says, uh, as I urged you upon my departure to Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard here, but uh, uh, strange doctrines. You may have false doctrines. You may have different doctrines or other doctrines. Uh, 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 strange doctrines, it's one word in the Greek. It, just, it, it means different teachings from what is standard. And so, uh, remember, they didn't have the Bible we have today. And they had the teachings of Paul and some of his writings. Uh, they had uh, perhaps, uh, this is one of, as we mentioned last week, this is uh, one of the last three letters that Paul wrote. So by this time, they may even have copies of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke at any rate. John probably doesn't get written for another uh, 30 years. But... Uh, but they've got some scriptures. Of course, they have the Old Testament uh, and the Old Testament. But he says strange doctrines. And so what were they teaching? Well, we'll get into that here in a minute. But, but a pastor's job, and, and so remember, these are part of the pastoral epistles. Uh, letters written to pastors with instructions. So it's instructions for the church. It's also instructions to people like me. And one of my jobs is to stifle false teachings. I need to be, I got to know what's being taught in the Sunday school. I've got to know who is teaching the Sunday school. Uh, and I've told you this story before. That when I was a Sunday school director in New Mexico, uh, I had to tell one person, you cannot teach anymore. You cannot teach here. And he left the church. And we said, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Uh, and that may sound strong, but we cannot tolerate uh, uh, false teachings within the church. Uh, we go to the end of uh, Timothy, chapter 6, and this is a verse I mentioned last week, but I'll mention it one or two more times. Chapter 6, verse 20 and 21, uh, Paul ends the letter to Timothy with, he said, O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter. We're going to talk about that chatter in a minute. And the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. Grace be with you. And so his parting words in this letter is to avoid false knowledge, what people will call knowledge. And, and so uh, he goes on to say uh, that he may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Where did he get these strange doctrines? From the world. And from the world. And so people want, uh, uh, one of the worst things that we have is folks who want to combine what's in Scripture with philosophies from the world. They want to put them together. And, and I used to tell the youth when we were a youth directors and youth leaders, I used to tell them the worst lie in the world is that lie that is 99% true. 
because that 1% gets through and it will kill you, literally. And so we've got to be careful here. And so I take, I, I, I take my job very seriously in knowing what is being taught. Now, verse 4 says, nor pay attention to myths. He's probably talking about Jewish myths here. There, there's a number of things in Jewish legends. We've got their writings. Uh, we can talk about a number of these things. But he says not to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. Uh, a lot of uh, Jews get caught up in who they're related to, and they can relate back 20 generations who their forefathers are. Uh, he says don't get hung up in all of that. Uh, we find in Mormonism. Uh, Mormons are very caught up in the knowing their genealogy. In fact, uh, the Ancestry site, uh, uh, which we've gotten our DNA ex examined and we know where our relatives are from, and it's nice to know, and I don't pursue it all that. But, you know, that's owned by the Mormons. Uh, 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 Mormons, if you, wanna, you want to know, dig into your family history, uh, go. It, it, a lot of these databases are controlled by Mormons. And, 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 and Paul is saying, don't get caught up into endless genealogies, which gives rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. So is genealogy wrong? Not, 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 not necessarily, but the problem is it diverts people from the truth. It diverts people from what they really need to be concentrating on. Uh, over in um, let me get it, Timothy, Timothy 4.7, he says, uh, uh, 1 Timothy 4.7, he says, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit for old ladies, old women, uh, old wives' tales, if you will. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. In Titus, and this is letter was written shortly after this letter, Titus 1, verses 14 to 16. He says, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience, uh, conscience are defiled. They, possessed, they profess to know God, but by their deeds... They deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. And so he goes on and on about warning about people uh, teaching on these things. And, and he says, uh, you know, that gives rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the, the administration of God, which is by faith. We take the word of God and we concentrate on that. I had someone ask me the other day, well, I need to go back and read what the Quran has to say about such and such. And, and I'm not going to mention the particulars here uh, because it relates to a few things that are in the Bible. And, and I, I had to say, no, you don't need to spend time in the Quran. You don't need to spend time investigating and reading the Book of Mormon. You don't need to spend time investigating a lot of these things because you don't know the Word of God yet. You don't know the Word of God. We need to spend time in the Word of God and not some of these other things that are out there. And they're out there. And they are out there. Uh, even the books we read, my commentaries... And I've mentioned this to you a number of times. Uh, the commentaries and the books that I go to, uh, I, I research the authors. I want to know, uh, are these scholars? Who are these scholars? Who recommends them? Who, uh, what are the reviews on them? And what's, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm particular about, uh, especially if they're uh, seminary professors. Which seminaries? You know, and, and, and uh, I, I'm particular who I read. And so we need to be careful. We need to be careful. Now, some of these guys uh, I read from, you know, I, I've told you before, you know, they know the Greek and Hebrew better than I know English. And, and I'll listen to what they have to say, but not everybody who knows Greek and Hebrew necessarily says the right things, okay? I want folks that are into the Word of God uh, generally conservative. And I, when I mean conservative, uh, uh, what I mean are, and, and people take this word wrong in today's world, 
uh, these are fundamentalist, okay? Uh, we get that word fundamentalist and we think of some, uh, uh, some Muslim fundamentalist who is waving swords and yelling jihad and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of times we get that word fundamentalist when it comes to Bible and we think folks are bringing around their big black King James Bible and thump people over the head with it. No, I'm th saying fundamentalists is they're into the Word of God and what the, and they believe the Word of God. It's not all uh, it, it's not all analogies and everything. And 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 in fact, as I was reviewing uh, some stuff from the science and the Bible course that I've taught in the past, uh, the big thing I, that came out of that, and I keep reminding myself, is I'm I'm realizing that the Bible is a lot more literal than I had ever imagined. What the Bible says, the Bible means. And, and there are some things that are, uh, uh, that are analogies and, and figures of speech, and those are clear. They're clear where those uh, things are. But there are other things, like the six days of creation, that is quite literal, quite literal. But uh, not going from there, he says to give rise to mere speculation, then furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. Verse 5. But the goal of our instruction, in fact, uh, some of the other translation may say the goal of our uh, command. Uh, but the word here in the Greek leads more to instruction. There's strong instruction. I'm giving you what you ought to be doing. Uh, he, he says, for the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Sincere, non-hypocritical. Uh, we're talking about our, the instruction that we get is to live a godly life. Give, live a life that is pleasing to the Lord in the will of God. And, and, and so the goal of preaching and teaching is to bring people in right relationship with God right relationship with God. But, verse 6, for some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussions. Meaningless, if you've got the NIV, and meaningless discussions. Uh, uh, in other words, there are people, and, and we see it around, they say lots of words, and they all sound nice, but there's no meat to it. It's not leading us anywhere. It's not leading us to a right relationship with the word. In fact, one of my commentators uh, mentioned uh, that, uh, um, let, me, let me find it here. And he says, the test of a good discussion is not what we've enjoyed in a verbal battle. You know, sometimes we get and we'll discuss something you know, especially in Sunday school, we discuss over a word or what somebody meant or what I think it says and this, that, and the other. And, and, and boy, it's that. We had a great discussion. Well, he goes, a uh, test of a good discussion is not what we've enjoyed, a verbal battle, but what has promoted the mutual understanding and love sincere, open-hearted, and based on faith. Are we any closer to the Lord because of it? What have we gained uh, in terms of our faith? And so we need to be discussing. Uh, we've got some people who, who major on minor things. I had a discussion the other day on things that uh, it didn't matter in the big scheme of things. Uh, I was asked if I would cover it, and I'm not going to mention the subject. But, but I said, you know, I, I will cover that when I come across it. But to make a whole sermon series on it, I'm not going there because it's not profitable. I'll cover it if we come to it. And, and these are important, but, uh, uh, but, but not to make it the major emphasis of teaching. So we need to be careful of what we do. He says, uh, for some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussions. Now, he's talking to the church in Ephesus. Now, we remember about 30 years later, uh, um, John writes uh, a number of letters that he gets straight from Jesus, okay, uh, contained in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. He had letters to seven churches. The first church he wrote to was Ephesus. 
And let me just read a few words from that. And this is Jesus speaking. Revelation 2, verses 2 to 4. He says, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and that you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have persevered and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Well, it sounds like they've done everything right. But, verse 4, but I have this against you that you have left your first love. The thing is, they may be teaching truth. But, you know, there are some truth that we need more than others, okay? And, and we need the truth of Jesus' love. We need the truth. Um, uh, I heard this thing the other day, and it's going to bear out in a sermon I'm going to preach here in a couple of weeks. Uh, he was talking about the good news. And the fact of the good news is the good news isn't good unless you know the bad news. And the bad news is you're going to hell without Jesus. That's the bad news. And we need to understand why and the wherefores and the particulars of that. And I'm going to be getting into it. That's a sermon I'm going to be preaching in a couple of weeks. But, but understand how we need to understand some things in order so we can focus on more important things. And we're building an understanding. And, and there is no other name under heaven by which we may be, may be saved. And we've got to understand what's important here. And he says, they have turned aside to fruitless discussions. And then, and then and it's coming out with their motive. Wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters of which they make uh, confident assertions. We've got a lot of people in Washington about the, uh, like that. They talk a lot about stuff that they have no idea what it is they're talking about. And we see that in the church as well. Uh, they're uh, babblers, you know. They talk about things that they know little or nothing about. But they have such a way about them, they're saying, wow, they're smart. Well, you know, this is one reason why when I get through teaching or preaching, I hope people go home and they say, if what he said, is it really in the Bible? And look it up. You need to be checking up on me. You need to check up on what people are saying. Is it true what they are saying? And you need to check for yourself. And you owe it to me. If I'm preaching something wrong, you owe it to me to come to me and tell me about it. You owe it to the church. Because the church doesn't need to hear me teaching anything false. And so the, the warning is there. He says uh, uh, they're wanting to be teachers of the law. Um, I, I spend a lot of time studying this because when I stand up and I say, thus saith the Lord, I want to make sure the Lord thus said it. And, and, and the thing is, we don't need to be making uh, suppositions or making um, speculations going back uh, to verse 4, which gives rise to mere speculation. I don't speculate on things. I give the word of God, and we've got to stick with the truth here. But it says they're talking about matters of the law. Now, what is the law? Uh, we, we could put our... Old Testament mindset on for a second. What is the law? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. It's kind of start there, but, but generally what they refer to the law is uh, the Torah, which is the first five books uh, of the Old Testament, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Uh, but more specifically, everything stemmed from the law, uh, stemmed from the Ten Commandments. And in fact, Jesus summed up the law. He says, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and et cetera, et cetera. And the second is, uh, uh, is love your neighbor as yourself. And it sums up everything right there. And, and it does. But, uh, but he says over in verse 8, uh, Paul's talking about the law. But we know that the law is good. The law is good. Romans 7, verses 12 through 13, Paul writes, he says, So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous is good. And therefore, uh, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. He says, rather it was sin. The law doesn't cause death. Me breaking the law causes death. Okay? And we got a word for that. We call it sin. We call it sin. 
And he says, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Galatians 3, verse 24. He says, therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. He goes on to say in Romans 7, 7, he says, what, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would have not come to know sin except through the law. The law is good because it teaches me what sin is. I break the law, I sin. And he, and, and he says, I would not know, come to know sin except through the law, for I would have not known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But here's the thing is, Galatians 2, verse 16, Paul goes and writes to the Galatians. He says, nevertheless, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. We can never be saved by the law. Why? Because we can't keep the law. I mean, anybody not lie? Who has not lied? Who has never lied before? Well, that's commandment number eight. I forget. I got to go back and look. But at any rate, we've broken the law. We have sinned. And, 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 and the scriptures say if we've broken one bit of the law, we have violated the whole law. And he says, we're not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. We can't keep the law. And so he says, we know that the law is good. Back to uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. And he says, if one uses it lawfully. Verse 9, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners. Now he's going to list a, a bunch of sinners here, okay? And hang with me here a second. And he says, for the ungodly and profane. Uh, when we look at the Ten Commandments, the first four are sins against God. He says, for the unholy and profane. Next, he says, for those who kill their fathers or mothers. What's, what's commandment number five? Honor your mother and father. And so that's, uh, we got one command. We, we've got, we're up to five commandments broken here. And he says, uh, for murderers, sixth commandment, which is, yeah, shall not kill. For murderers, which uh, translated correctly, it's not shall not kill, thou shall not murder, premeditated murder. But thou shall not murder. And immoral men and homosexuals, now, if we group number seven under do not commit adultery as far as sexual sin is concerned, this can be grouped under those if we, if we want to expand the meaning of that. Uh, but we're talking about morality. Immoral men, and, and that word immoral, uh, talking about uh, sexual sin here, and homosexuals. Uh, I don't need to go any further there. And kidnappers, kidnappers, uh, in that sense, used in that century, we're talking about why would you kidnap people? To turn them into slaves. They're slavers, if you will. And so what is the ultimate? That's uh, uh, the commandment about stealing. Okay, you shall not steal, okay? Because you're stealing somebody's life and selling them away into slavery. We're kidnappers. And liars and perjurers, that's the ninth commandment. You should not lie. And, uh, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Um, he didn't mention coveting, but we mentioned coveting over in Romans 7. But uh, it got pretty near all the Ten Commandments right there. All these people. And, and he says, uh, uh, realizing the law is not for the righteous person. You know, think about it. Even in your own homes, those of you with kids... Think about the rules that you make in your home. More times than not, you've made the rule because somebody broke it, right? Somebody is, you know, if, if, if we did the right thing all the time, we're in the will of God. We go, we go to, if we're always doing the right thing, there's no need for rules. Think about it. The rules are for the lawbreakers. 
so we can set clear boundaries. It's not for the righteous, not for the righteous. And he says, whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. That word teaching is also can be translated doctrine. When you hear about doctrine, when you hear about doctrine, that's just another word for teachings. Uh, this particular word is in 1 Timothy seven times. It is a central theme, as I mentioned last week in our introduction. It's a central theme in 1 uh, Timothy is sound teaching. Do we adhere to sound teaching? Do we adhere to what conforms to Scripture? What conforms to Scripture? And verse 11 says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God of which I have been entrusted. We've been entrusted. Uh, First Thessalonians 2, 4, he says, but just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our heart. You know, my... Uh, my job is, uh, what does people say? Sometimes I'm, I'm here to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted, you know. It's, uh, I'm bringing the word of God. And, and, and if it steps on your toes, if the shoe fits, wear it. It's, it's, it's up to me to teach the word of God. I've been entrusted with that. Um, let me see, Titus 1, verse 3. He says, but at the proper time manifested even his word and the proclamation which I was entrusted, Paul talking here, according to the commandment of God our Savior. We've been entrusted with the gospel. Everything is judged in accordance with the gospel of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus, the good news about Jesus, our salvation that's found in Jesus and Jesus alone. Uh, uh, something I'm going to be preaching on. Um, there's only one way to heaven. There's not many roads. It doesn't matter how sincere. There are people who sincerely believe what they believe, and they're sincerely going to hell. Because there's no other name given under heaven by which men may be saved. Jesus says, I am the way, not a way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you've heard me preach that. So he's talking about sound doctrine. Next week, actually in two weeks, because we're not going to be meeting next week uh, because of Thanksgiving. We're not having any Wednesday activity next week, but we'll go on with the rest of the chapter uh, talking about uh, uh, Paul's story, if you will, and we'll get into that next week. Any questions before we close? Any questions? All right. Well, it's been a good evening. And uh, this is a good start in our study. A lot of stuff in here. And, and the thing I like, uh, like I've said before, about going through verse by verse, I'm not bypassing anything. Even if it's uncomfortable to me, I'm going to preach it. And so it's, uh, and some of it uh, may be repetitive, but uh, we'll go over it. And uh, if it's repetitive, it's repetitive for a reason, because we need to know it. All right. Let me go ahead and close this in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word and may we be faithful to your word. May we embrace Jesus and Lord, take this gospel, the good news of Jesus to a world that is lost and dying around us. May we be faithful in these things and Lord, that we test everything that we hear and see in the world by the word of God. And, Lord, that we won't be drawn after false teachings as we were warned about tonight. Watch over us tonight, be in all that we say and do, and that all that we say and do, that we might bring honor and glory to Jesus, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, this Sunday, I do want to mention two things. Very quick, and then we'll sign off, David, after this. Uh, Sunday, I'm preaching about uh, Thanksgiving. It's Thanksgiving week. But that's God's will is for us to be thankful. And then Sunday night, Sunday evening, we have our community Thanksgiving service. Uh, it's over at Rocky Bayou uh, Baptist Church. And we're going to have our jail chaplain, uh, Josiah Aldridge. Good man. He's, despite the fact that he's Presbyterian, uh, I love him to death. He is a good man, and I'm anxious to hear what he has to say 
uh, uh, and he has a heart for the jail ministry, and I've worked with him uh, for a number of years at the jail, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So I encourage you to come Sunday night to Rocky Bayou. God bless you all.